boss battles are one of the most iconic elements of video games as an entertainment form. Acting as the culmination of a story, a battle, or a journey that you've been invested in for however many hours, they provide unique gameplay scenarios that are exclusive to their encounters and make you play the game differently to how you've been playing it for the past 10 or 20 hours. But ultimately, they provide a sense of closure to those story threads once complete. Almost every franchise imaginable has thrown their hat into the boss battle ring over the years, from Pokemon and Metal Gear to Call of Duty and, of course, Halo, and some have been received better than others. Now, it's not very often that you hear the words Halo and boss battle uttered under the same breath, and I think that's for good reason. Halo has a very strange history with boss battles, and given their apparent return in Halo Infinite, I thought it was finally time that we take a look at this strange history. Now, Halo boss battles can, technically speaking, be traced all the way back to Halo Combat Evolved. Although it was far from a boss fight in the traditional sense, your final encounter with Guilty Spark in the engine room on the moor was what I would kind of class as a boss fight to some degree. Now, this is less of a typical boss fight scenario and rather a unique encounter created by an antagonist that the player has to overcome. It was nothing crazy, I mean, you literally just shot rockets into four holes for a satisfying explosion, but it was the origin of Halo's strange history with boss battles, so I figured it was worth mentioning. It was Halo 2 where Bungie really committed to boss fights in Halo and the results were rather interesting. What if you miss? I won't. So, their first real attempt was with the Heretic Leader, a battle that had a fantastic narrative and thematic build-up. I wondered who the Prophets would send to silence me. An Arbiter. I'm flattered. The entire chase sequence was nothing short of perfect. Pursuing this heretic through a facility plunged into a state of mania, succumbing to an out-of-control flood outbreak with every man inside from three different factions fighting for himself as the station plummeted through the clouds of the gas giant to a certain doom. The build-up could not have been better, and neither could the pre-fight cutscene. The Arbiter coming this close to actually believing what Spark and the Heretic were saying about the Great Journey, about the Prophets, and how it was all a lie. Only for the Heretic to think that Arbiter was too far gone and open fire on him at the last moment. It was such a damn good setup. Honestly, perfect. Even the hologram reveal was really cool, but the fight itself kinda wasn't. I mean, the Heretic Leader was basically just an elite, the holograms were so easy to spot and even easier to take out, and the fight itself is typically over in 10 to 15 seconds. On Legendary, it's definitely a bit better. You get an extended version of the fight where the Heretic goes invincible for a bit and gives you more dialogue, but still, overall, the Heretic Leader is not a great boss fight. <laughs> but don't worry, he was followed by an even worse boss fight. The Prophet of Regret. Now, in the words of Marty O'Donnell, Prophet of Regret, you beat an old man up in a, in a wheelchair. Are you kidding me? That was, that was, we, we laughed while we were doing it. The fans don't like it. Not even Bungie likes it. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Regret was the worst Bungie era boss fight. The arena that you fought him in was pretty cool, and the constant onslaught of honor guards was really cool thematically, but realistically, the fight itself was just not good. On harder difficulties, there are no interesting changes besides having to board regret more than once, and on Legendary, the honor guards are insufferable. However, I will say there is one positive takeaway from this entire thing. As bad as the regret fight was, it was still so much better than having Chief kill him in a cutscene, giving the player the agency to carry out important plot threads themselves over watching a pre-scripted event play out in a cutscene that's completely out of their control is something that should only ever be applauded, regardless of how badly it's executed, and it's something that I wish more games nowadays would learn from. However, to round out Halo 2, we took down Tartarus, the Chieftain of the Brutes, the Arbiter's primary antagonist, and considering Halo 2 was mainly about the Arbiter, Halo 2's primary antagonist as well. Now this was a traditional boss fight done right. It was far from perfect, and there are plenty of better boss fights out there, don't get me wrong, 
but the slow, agonizing tension between the two that only strengthened after Tartarus thought he'd killed the Arbiter combined really well with the mechanics of this fight to create a truly memorable experience. Again, it's nothing crazy, but the fact that you can circumvent having to wait for Johnson to fire his beam rifle at Tartarus to bring down his invincibility by actually picking up a beam rifle yourself before the Banshee section and taking it into the fight is a really cool little detail that allows you to approach the fight differently in replays. Honestly, if it weren't for this mechanic, I think the boss fight would be a lot worse. If you had no choice but to wait for an indeterminate amount of time for Johnson to land all three shots, which by the way, he doesn't always hit, to actually be able to damage Tartarus, the pacing, oh my god, the pacing would be terrible. Granted, the cool arena design and infinite supply of elites does help to draw him off your back when he is invincible, but still, having the option there to skip the wait is a great feature, and on top of the narrative elements, it really made the Tartarus fight a fight to remember. Now, it seemed that after Halo 2, Bungie had kind of learned their lesson and toned down the boss fights, for better or worse. However, it seems that this wasn't always the plan. For example, a boss fight with a Guardian Sentinel that would have taken place in the Guardian Forest was cut from the campaign. Thankfully, the absolute madman rejected shotgun has somehow managed to restore this fight in some capacity, so we now have an idea of what never came to be, but besides this cut beauty, Halo 3 only really has two boss battles. The first being the Scarab. Now, the Scarab encounters aren't exactly traditional boss battles, however, they absolutely earn the title of being a boss. Cauliflower's not traditional, Dad. CAULIFLOWER IS TRADITIONAL! I don't know if it really is traditional, actually. The most genius thing to me is that the Scarab itself is not like a pre-scripted entity or a vehicle. Rather, it's an actual enemy with its own AI that moves and attacks as per its own free will. The way that it interacts with other enemy AI and the play space that you fight it in makes for a truly unique, dynamic experience that really never plays the same way. And the same can be said for your approach in taking it down as well. There are so many different ways to take down a Scarab that all play really well into Halo 3's fantastic sandbox and prove more than anything that Halo is at its best when it's at the behest of the sandbox, not when the player is the sandbox. Just to name a few, you can take out the Scarab's legs with any vehicle, like a mongoose or a warthog, whether you're a driver, a gunner, or a passenger. Or you can take out its legs with a regular weapon or turret, like a missile pod or a spanker. You can use a gravity lift to board it while it's still moving, or rather, you can use a height advantage in the environment to board it while it's still moving. You could use a missile pod to shoot out the rear protection and then take out its core while it's still moving. Or, if you want, you could board it normally and kill all the Covenant on board for a clean execution. Or, you can skip as many of the Covenant as possible, focus only on destroying the core, and then watch them all go flying 20 seconds later. And that's to just name a few. And then, once you're successful, whichever way you go about that success, you're rewarded with the most satisfying explosion in a video game to date, with incredible physics effects to go alongside it. It really doesn't get much better than this. Halo 3 to me is the absolute peak of Halo boss battles and it's agonizing that Halo 3 in 2007 was the last time that we fought one in an FPS. And then to round out Halo 3, we finally got to kill 343 Guilty Spark. Now, this fight is very similar to Regrets in that it's really an incredibly lame boss fight to be honest. Like. I don't even know if you could even call it a true boss fight, but at the end of the day, the campaign is objectively better off thanks to its inclusion. I do think that Johnson giving you his Spartan laser to finish Spark off with was a nice touch, and I'd also be lying if I said that killing him wasn't incredibly satisfying. As an encounter, it was pretty good, but as a boss fight, which again, I'm not entirely sure if it was even meant to be, it really wasn't that great. I mean, Marty did tell me last year that originally they had more plans for the Spark boss fight, but ran out of time in Halo 3's development, which kind of sucks, but at least we, the player, were actually able to put that bastard down ourselves. I'll take that any day over a cutscene. 
Okay, so before we get to Halo 4's boss fight, a quick word from today's sponsor, Audible. Now, the other day, Halo Point of Light released, the audiobook of which is on Audible, and I have a video coming out in a few days about it because the links this thing has to Halo Infinite are astronomical in the best ways imaginable. I am so hyped to release that video, but in the meantime, you can listen to the Point of Light audiobook on Audible along with almost every single other Halo audiobook ever released. All you gotta do is go to audible.com slash hiddenxperia, or text hiddenxperia to 500-500 to start your 30-day free Audible trial and get full access to thousands upon thousands of audiobooks, original entertainment, and podcasts included in the Audible Plus plan. Using Audible, you can catch up on your Halo lore on your phone or tablet whenever and wherever you are. And with the absolute juice contained within Point of Light, that is something that you're going to want to be doing. Trust me. So, once again, go to audible.com slash hiddenxperia or text hiddenxperia to 500 and get that free 30-day trial started today and gain access to all of these Halo audiobooks and more. Thank you to Audible for sponsoring the video. Go and listen to Point of Light, and let's get back to the video. Right, Halo 4. So, on top of the many interesting choices that 343 made with this game, they also made a choice that is almost universally hated with the final boss, the Didact. Now, the Didact, as a character, was already quite polarizing. Some loved him in Halo 4, others can't stand him. Personally, I really liked him and his story in Halo 4. Uh, Granted, I don't think he got anywhere near as much screen time as he deserved, but coming face to face with one of the mysterious characters from the Halo 3 terminals was great. However, the way that we killed this mysterious character was not great. Now, again, credit where it's due, at least we got to press the button to kill the Didact instead of it being done in a cutscene, but really what we got was as close to a cutscene as possible without it actually being some cringe-tier Jillum Dharma cutscene. <laughs> Having an antagonist this significant be killed in what was frankly just a pathetic quick time event was so lame. The idea of having a boss battle on that light bridge with the composer composing thousands of humans a second on Earth above you would have been amazing, and it would have had a great sense of finality and would have made for a fantastic stage to end the game on, but instead we got press RT to kill bad guy, or rather press RT to fight a machine gun. I'm happy at least that we got to do it, but the Didact boss fight, if it can even be called a boss fight, was such a lame ending for such a fantastic character. Oh god, okay, here we go. The Warden Eternal in Halo 5. Now, again, credit where it's due. Props to 343 for at least trying a more conventional boss fight, but Jesus Christ, please, please never put us through anything like this again. Having to fight the same boss in the exact same way seven times over in one game was excruciating because, like, he wasn't even fun to fight in the first place. I don't think he was a bad boss per se, but he definitely did not earn the right to have us fight him seven times. As far as mechanics go, it was pretty run-of-the-mill, to be honest with you. I mean, he had a weak spot on his back, you shoot the weak spot to do more damage, and then you assassinate him when he gets really low. Nothing groundbreaking. Besides the repetitiveness of his fights, one of the Warden's biggest issues was actually something that he inherited from the Prometheans. Terrible, terrible damage feedback. He barely, if at all, reacts unless you shoot him right in the weak spot, which just makes the fight so dull. It feels like I'm shooting at a wall the entire time. Much like Halo 5 overall, I see what 343 were going for with the Warden, but it just fell flat on its face. Please, never put us through toil like this again. I am begging you. And finally, we have a rather odd boss, actually. The Decimus boss fight in Halo Wars 2. Now, considering this was a boss fight designed for an RTS, there was a lot of gameplay constraints that come with that style of game that the fight had to be designed around. But honestly, I think even with that, Creative Assembly did a damn good job here. Decimus has several unique mechanics and even phases to his boss fight. The first phase isn't even in the mission where you kill him, it's a few before that when you first encounter him decked out in his badass mech. 
At first he just seems like a rather tough brute, but then, when he sustains too much damage, he puts down a bubble shield and becomes invincible as he calls on the shipmaster to use the enduring conviction to glass the area around him, which was really cool. Then, when you meet him again, he still does this, but his fight is broken up into two phases. The first phase is just the same as his regular boss fight, with the only difference being that he's a bit stronger. Then, when he takes too much damage, he jumps across the arena and becomes untargetable, calling in a bunch of random glassing beams that you have to avoid, as well as spawning regular units. And then, when he re-enters the fight, he has engineers healing him and his mech's mace gets the ability to pull enemy units towards it. Overall, this is a really in-depth and mechanically intensive boss fight for an RTS game. It's not exactly comparable to a boss fight in an FPS or any other genre of game, but honestly, it's a damn good effort for such a radically different genre, and a great way to round out Halo's boss fights. So, as you can see, Halo's history with boss fights is all over the place, ranging from decent to just downright awful, so the possibility of Halo Infinite bringing them back gives me a combined sense <laughs> of both excitement and also nervousness. There really isn't much that it can learn from its own franchise when it comes to boss fights. So, I want to round out this video by briefly touching on some of my favourite boss fights from other games that I would love to see Halo Infinite take a modicum of inspiration from. Okay, so a few of these are going to be from Metal Gear Solid, which, if you watch any of my videos, should be no surprise to you. To say that I'm a Metal Gear fan is quite the understatement. The first one being Psycho Mantis from Metal Gear Solid 1. So, the whole shtick with Psycho Mantis is that he has psychokinetic powers, which specifically equate to psychokinesis and telepathy. And the way that Kojima has Mantis convey this information to the player <laughs> is nothing short of genius, so instead of just having him exposit it through dialogue in the game and then have him, like, move a crate in-game or something, he breaks the fourth wall and has Mantis demonstrate these abilities in a way that personally connects to the player as a real human being and feels like something that a simple video game character could never be capable of, especially at the time the game came out. He has Mantis connect to the real world in one of the most intelligent forms of game design I think I've ever seen. So, he starts out by demonstrating his telepathy by telling you really oddly specific details about your journey in the game, like how many enemies you've killed, how many times you've fallen to your death, and how many times you've saved the game. But then he takes it a step further by literally name-dropping other games that the player is a fan of, games that have nothing to do with Metal Gear. The logic behind this is really simple, he just basically reads the player's memory card and looks for saves from other games, but even though it's quite obvious, it still has such a strong effect. Then, he has you put your controller on the floor and demonstrates his psychokinesis by literally having it move around in real life. Again, all that happens is the controller just vibrates like crazy, which causes it to move around on the floor, but seeing the character actually in-game create this effect in the real world is unlike any other video game boss out there. When the boss fight actually begins, he shouts blackout, which makes the screen go black and look as if you accidentally changed the channel in an old CRT TV, which, bear in mind, is what everyone was playing this game on when it came out. Because he can read your mind, whenever you go to shoot him, he just teleports away because he knew that you were going to do that. So, how do you beat him? You unplug your controller and plug it into a different port in the console so he can no longer read your mind. Absolutely genius. Honestly, if you ask me, this is the smartest boss battle in the history of video games, and I don't even think anything comes close, quite honestly. Psycho Mantis is a masterpiece. And then, another absolute gem for Metal Gear Solid 1 is the Grey Fox fight, the Cyborg Ninja. His introduction scene is nothing short of a masterpiece. Seeing your enemies fleeing from an invisible horror that's cutting them to shreds and who's on his way to the same place that you are was such a great way to build tension and just like most MGS boss fights, the tension was well earned. You approach the boss fight the way that all previous boss fights have conditioned you to. You go in all guns blazing, ready to light him up with your famas. But you soon realise that that's not going to work, it does nothing. 
Grey Fox is a cyborg ninja. He can dodge your bullets with ease, as hinted at in his opening cutscene. He respects the art of combat and the honour of a fair battle. And so, the only way to damage him is to lay down your firearms and engage him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Incredible theming, incredible soundtrack, and just an overall incredible boss. Another incredible boss fight that comes, yet again, from Metal Gear Solid is The End from MGS3. A 100-year-old sniper, capable of photosynthesis and who can communicate with the forest. Now, the regular boss fight for The End is really damn good. You fight him in three separate areas that he moves through and because he's in a ghillie suit, he's really, really hard to spot. So much so that in some cases, you have to get the directional microphone out and scan the environment to listen out for his breathing. The End is a fantastic boss just as is, but when you really put your mind to it and use the information that's given to you in the codec calls and his intro cutscene, you'll realise there's another really obvious method that you can use to take him out. This guy is a hundred years old. He talks about how his fight with you is his final hunt, and when you first meet him, he's unconscious. So, what can you do? <laughs> you can save the game and come back a week later in real time, and he'll have died from old age. Again, kind of silly, but when you really put your mind to it, it's absolutely genius. MGS boss fights really make you think outside of the box, which, considering you're playing an unrealistic video game, really means thinking as rationally as possible, which is a smart, ingenious way of designing boss fights. And finally, I just want to touch on two very quickly from Dark Souls that I think are just, once again, absolutely genius. Firstly, Dancer of the Boreal Valley. Now, Dark Souls is renowned for incredible bosses, but Dancer is easily my favourite because of the way that her movement syncs up with her theme. Her footsteps basically act as the drum in her theme song, which creates this incredible link between the music and the gameplay that makes the entire thing just feel a bit more immersive. It's not exactly a gameplay mechanic or anything, but it's just an incredible little detail that makes the battle more memorable somehow than it already is. And then, Slave Knight Gale, the final boss fight in the entire series. Now, Gale is a frustratingly enjoyable boss because of just how overwhelming he is. His moveset is so big and he has so many different attacks that the tension is just astronomical for the entire fight, and because of this, like most Dark Souls bosses, you're not gonna beat him on your first time. The underlying element of Dark Souls, and really of any Miyazaki game overall to be honest, is progression through death. This idea that to advance through the game, you have to die and you have to learn from that death. It's a philosophy that I really wish more games nowadays would embrace because it adds so much character to the experience, and Gale is just the perfect personification of this philosophy, which is very fitting considering he's the final boss in the entire franchise. After like 20 to 30 deaths and about 5 broken controllers, finally beating him might be the most satisfying feeling on planet Earth. You really feel like you earned the victory, and that, more so than anything, is something that I really hope Halo Infinite's bosses can provide. And so, that's it. Halo's strange history with boss fights, with a bit of an added prologue of some of my favourite boss fights in gaming that I really would like to see Halo Infinite take a few notes from. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me hear your favourite Halo boss fights or just your favourite bosses in general down below in the comments. And with that said, that's going to do it for today. I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the continued support over there as per usual. And thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.